Hello, everyone out in Facebook land and live with us in Zoom with Celebration Magazine Live. I am Zoe Frost, your hostess with the mostest. And as you can see behind me today, we are at the Frontiers of Flight Museum in Dallas, Texas, right by Love Field. I'm all right, everyone. So we have with us today someone very special. We have Dan Steelman. He is the vice president of exhibits and collections. I think I rewound them around. So it's collections and exhibits here at the Frontiers of Flight Museum. And he's going to be showing us around. Let me flip this camera. Take it away, Dan. Well, hello, everybody. I'm Dan Steelman, and uh, welcome to the Frontiers of Flight Museum here in Dallas. Uh, we call ourselves the premier air and space museum in Texas because we have uh, four, 30 aircraft and half a dozen spacecraft and about 35,000 artifacts that I care for in the process of taking care of this museum. So, We've got a large collection, and one of the most recent pieces that we have to be part of our collection is this aircraft here. It's an EA six speed Prowler. And up until a, about a year and a half ago, it was part of the US Marine Corps. And then they retired it and it came here. Now, before go, being uh, assigned to the museum, it was actually overseas and it was in the fighting in Iraq and Iran. And uh, it was uh, in overseas there, and it is an electronic warfare aircraft. And one thing that you might want to notice, and I don't know if you can show back up a little bit or walk around here, and if you look at the tail of the aircraft, you'll see that it has a big pronounced bulge on it. And that's, <clears throat> they call that the football. And the football, is where they house a lot of electronic wizardry that we don't know anything about. It's that black box that's in there. And basically what this would do would jam uh, radars, it would jam different types of electronic signals, including cell phone signals. And this airplane uh, was <clears throat> probably responsible for saving a lot of lives overseas because in the war, in uh, Afghanistan and Iraq, they would use a lot of IEDs, uh, these uh, uh, explosive devices that would blow people up and Humvees and things like that. And they would set them off with a cell phone signal. Well, this would block the cell phone signals. So a lot of guys that might have been attacked were not attacked because of this airplane. So it had. Uh, not only did it keep uh, other aircraft safe from radar, it kept ground crew, crew safe. They retired it and now it's the same uh, function is being carried out by a uh, plane they call the Growler, which is a version of the F-18. Very cool. I'm going to take a walk back here so everybody mm -hmm. can see. The I, I love the uh, cover they have on it, which you'll see. So as you as you can see here, the wings are folded up. I think mm -hmm. uh, the mechanics in there are insane. Mm -hmm. It's a beautiful, beautiful ship. And I was told that Dan did not make this thing because he does not have a red car. I, do not have a red car. <laughs> it's not my fault. I love I was that. So marine sometime back in the past. <laughs> So let's come around to the front so you can see what I'm talking about here. He looks like he belongs in the uh, Disney movie Cars with his little cover on him. But we'll do a slow. I was going to ask here. about that. So is that a cover over the glass? It is a cover. It's a cover yeah. over the cockpit. The okay. interesting thing about the cockpit is it is has gold plating, a very thin layer of gold, and that is to, uh, to uh, keep the electronics safe. Uh, so the gold protects the electronics in the cockpit. Oh, wow. Very cool. And so, but it also would fade very quickly since it's outside. So we have, and it's got personality. It does. I love we it. Expecting, we weren't really expecting that 
this, uh, a group called the DFW Tailhookers. They're a local veterans group mm -hmm. helped us to get this aircraft. And they have, uh, they are kind of the sponsors of the airplane. And they decided that they would uh, go together and get the uh, cover for the canopy. And they decided they'd also add a little personality to it. And I, I think it looks great. And so when you're driving down Lemon Avenue, you can look up and you can see the smiling face of our airplane. Oh, cool. I'm going to show everybody here too. So here's some, uh, some tech information. So the max speed is 644 miles per hour. Wow. And it weighs 58,600 pounds. That's the max weight. Empty, it's 26,600 pounds. So just some really interesting information on there. This flew from 1960 to 1997. Wow. Uh, actually, you're reading the Oh, I'm reading the wrong the one. one. Oh, look at me. I don't know what I'm talking about. This aircraft was derived from the A6 Intruder. Got it. Uh, and a lot of the guys from the tail hookers, they love the Intruder, but they were Intruder pilots. And so they included this in the signage, but this is actually the Prowler. Prowler, got and, it. Uh, it's, as you can see, it's a little bit faster, a uh, little bit heavier, a little more weight to it. Maximum weight was over 61,000 pounds. And wow. it would carry electronic warfare and harm missiles, harm or anti-radiation missiles. That they, if uh, they were flying around and they were lit up, uh, say a, a radar uh, station pick them up they'd be able to find the location of that radar station and use a harm missile and the missile traced it would follow the track of the radiation from coming from the uh, uh, radar station and destroy the radar station. oh wow okay uh, yeah so the, most of the time they didn't get bothered by these people because they knew as soon as they got lit up that they might be uh become a victim of a hard missile. Very cool. All right. So where are we headed to next? We're going to go to the front of the building. Uh, actually, no, let's go over here. All I right. So this is an F-16 so. right here. We're walking past this one. Look at the demonstrator. All right. I want you to see what most people, what we're noticed first off, Besides the smiling uh, prowler, this is the main thing that people would notice. They said, you've got an airplane sticking out of your building. And I said, yeah, yeah, yeah. We didn't have problems with the brakes. We did that on purpose. And uh, you'll see the rest of the airplane uh, when we go on the inside tour. But this is the uh, backside of it. And it sticks out here. And we have a nice uh, area for picnickers to come out here and sit underneath. How neat. Guys, it is a beautiful area. Zoe, can you hear me? I can hear you. Just making sure uh, that we're looking towards the camera when we're talking. We're just sometimes we're losing some stuff, okay? Yep, we got okay. it. Thanks, right. guys. So we are now going to walk towards the front. We're walk towards the front of the building. And so this is as though you are coming into the building and you're, you're getting the tour as though you are just, uh, you're here. So we're going to walk around to the front, the front entrance. You might want to show them the sign there. It says front, front entrance. entrance. And I, I also want to show you, so here's their, their sign with an army helicopter there in the distance. Walk backwards. Yep, we're good. He's going to make sure I don't fall. But make this... sure that she's following you, staying on the straight and narrow. Huh. Huh. But, uh, yeah, we are, we've been here, the museum has been around for quite some time. It's been here since about 2001, I think, is when they really actually took to this location. Prior to then, it was over in the terminal building, upstairs in the terminal. The thing over this Thank you. All right. There He's you keeping me straight. Yeah. And so, after the we had so much, uh, so many people wanted to come to the museum that we wound up building this building. And it is actually two hangars in one. This hangar that we are just walking past right now was a pre existing hangar. It's one of the oldest hangars at Love Field. And then we built the rest of the facility. 
and uh, just added onto it and made it one gigantic hangar. We have about 100,000 square foot under roof. Wow, that's big. It's pretty big. Yeah, get ready to start turning. Yep, I got this. Yeah, she's got it. She, this isn't her first road yet. <laughs> she's done this before. All right. Oh, hey, by the way, Gabriels, thank you. So we're a day late, but we're never too, we're never too late to uh, thank our vets. So coming on in. All right, so I'm going to turn around real quick just so you can see what your view is when you walk in here. So this is what you're going to be greeted by. This is what you're going to be greeted by when you come in. And when you come here, you're going to be greeted by wonderful staff here. A museum store. And then we have our volunteer board. Now, these guys are great. You're going to love them. And uh, they look for the red vests. They're very proud of those vests. They've got all kinds of paraphernalia on there because uh, it's not their first rodeo either. So these are our volunteers these, right here. Yeah, yeah. So did you both serve? Or are you from the military? Are you airmen? What did you do? I retired this is natural for me. Nice. So you were and you weren't. Explain that to I, me. I was drafted. Uh-huh. I did two years in the service as a combat engineer. Two years as a combat engineer. Uh, let's see. I worked over 30 years for the Boeing company. Ah, over 30 years worked for Boeing. And if you can see he's got uh, yeah. his patch. How neat. And, Oh, oh yeah. He's, he's, he's going so these gentlemen are here to help you if you have questions when you That's come in. Right. So they're wonderful. Thank, Thank you, guys. Uh, <laughs> uh, all right. So we're going to come this way first and uh, start here with this helicopter. If anybody has, if you were a fan of the movie Mash. Uh, and the TV show MASH. I was a fan of the TV show more so than the movie. But uh, you probably would recognize this helicopter just because uh, it was utilized quite a bit in the movie and in the TV show. And they used it uh, for emergency evacuation of wounded personnel. Oh, wow. And it was green. This is a trainer version of the helicopter, a little a bit later than Korean War vintage. But it's the same general uh layout and uh, but at the in the mash they would have these different uh uh men here oh wow they on, would put I, on the outside on so, those, uh, so they scales. would carry wounded on the outside here Penny years is what they were called Mm -hmm. Very neat. Okay, so here's my question. Sure. How long are the blades? Those blades are going to be, let's see, is it in here? 11.3 meters. Wow. Uh, 31 feet. 31 feet. No, 37 feet. So here, I'm going to show you total 37 feet from end to end on these blades. I'm gonna try and get away from the windows so you guys can get a good good look at this. And Captain America. So kind of show you what this guy looks like. I like the bubble, how it's completely great visibility. Fantastic visibility. And then if you're familiar with the TV show map, they might remember the sign. Mm. So if you remember MASH, you might remember the sign. Mm -hmm. Oh, cool. Yeah. So this is from, so the, the mileage is, the distance is listed on this is from a central position in Korea. So this is how far you would have to go. So 6,000, looks like 116 miles to, uh, to Death Valley. 
why are you going to go there on your own? Yeah, I don't right. either. <laughs> Coney uh, Island, some, that's a good one. Island, supposedly, the uh, characters from the show were from these locations. Oh. And so, um, uh, maybe that, well, not Seoul, but basically Boston. I think that one of the doctors uh, mm -hmm. was from Boston. Coney Island, San Francisco. And then Tokyo was probably where the last place they stopped before coming into uh, the uh, Korean area. How neat. How neat. All right. Uh, which... We're going to go this way. Right. We're going to uh, go uh, check back. We're going to see the rest of the plane we're that's in the building. The rest of that airplane. You saw the tail of it. We're going to see the nose of it. <laughs> that's his airplane. That's his airplane. He's climbing it back. Yeah. <laughs> so this area, we have a lot of uh, birthday parties in mm -hmm. this area usually. Now with COVID, we've had to cancel all these birthday parties and stuff. You know, if you've got the uh, kids or grandkids that are missing out on their birthday parties, I feel for them. Because, uh, uh, only recently did we open up the kids area. Mm. This area is uh, great for kids to come and play. We've got a little, a little theater. Then they could climb to the top of the, the control tower there. So there's all kinds of stuff going on that they can do. So and this there's plenty of room for them to run around and get all that energy out. So we're in a, a spotty area. I just kind of want to give everybody warning that hallway is the worst test area. But this is a new children's area that was recently completed and then the world happened. Um, but this is a great area for kids to come and learn and play. So now we're coming. If you want to flip around, you can see the nose of that airplane. Backside's outside. So this is the airplane that comes through the window. The backside is outside. This is the same one. And it says it's the spirit of Kitty Hawk. This is a 737 aircraft. It was a model 300, which is considered the classic version. It's uh, when you, you can hear 737s taking off. We're fairly frequently here mm -hmm. because of Love Field the, and Southwest Airlines. Most of them are going to be larger than this airplane because they stretch them and they, so they can carry more people. But this was a 737-300 uh, and it was the first 737-300 flown by Southwest Airlines. Oh, wow. And it was uh, had its first flight on December 17th which is the exact same thing that the uh, Wright brothers flew on at Kitty Hawk. Oh, wow. So that's why it's called the Spirit of Kitty Hawk, because it first flew on the same day that the Wright brothers. Very flew. neat. Many years later, but it's the same uh, date on the power. So teaser alert, we uh, we might have a replica that we're going to see of the Wright it brothers play. <laughs> And so, unfortunately, because of COVID, this is usually off limits, but because you guys are special. We're special. Yeah, you're going on up. So we're going to try, we're going to come up here and we're going to try and see if I can get a good signal and look into, here, let's do this first, because I can, I can kind of give you a peek this way of what we're going to try and look at. So we're going to go in the plane and see what we can see. I'm concerned because it's all metal. So, right there. All those controls. Oh my goodness. Yeah. Those, this is back before all the uh, electronic cockpit where it's all glass, glass cockpit. Zo? Yes. You might need to do some repeating because we're having a hard time hearing in some of the yeah, spots. We were just we were just showing. So what were you talking about before? I said that this particular cockpit that you were looking at had a lot of controls and gauges and stuff. The modern cockpits that the on the more current 737s have glass cockpits, what they call. And so it's a lot of electronic screens and that sort of thing. And you don't see as many uh, dials and all those gauges and stuff. They were taking up flying, just like your car or your uh, new car. 
it's got all kinds of a lot more screens. <laughs> screens same way with airplanes except even more so very cool all right so we're going to go over here and check out the yeah. flight simulator right that's right the sr 71 flight simulator it's the only one in the world they only made one it was for the sr 71 and the it was made first for the Air Force, and then the NASA used it when NASA flew the SR-71. And then whenever they uh, deactivated the SR-71, they just gave us the uh, the uh, uh, flight simulator. And like I said, it's the only one in the world. Let's go check it out. Very cool. All right, so I have a silly question that came up. So they want to know if the new airplanes come with a backup camera. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, they come with staff. Oh, there you go. They come with people who just walk around and uh, wing walkers and they watch the nose and the tail of the aircraft. And so they don't have to do that. <laughs> they, got, they got people for that. They got people. <laughs> yeah, they got a posse that just kind of follows that airplane until it gets ready to take off. This is the SR-71 Blackbird. This is our exhibit here. And this, I apologize, there's some noise from some of our electronics going on here. We may have some music in the background, but this is the, this is the cockpit. Now, this is a cool thing because basically if you're a student, you're gonna be sitting up front. So you sit all the way up there if all you're a student. First, first, uh, where it says attention, attention. authorized personnel only. Uh -huh. right. so that's where the pilot would sit. And he's looking at the exact replica of the uh, cockpit of the aircraft. Now, the instructor is in this orange seat and he's got the same gauges and stuff, but they're scattered in different orientation than the actual cockpit. Okay. But he can see all of the things that the pilot or, or the student is seeing. Mm -hmm. All right, now if you come over here and you can see there is a CRT monitor here. We'll see the old CRT monitor. Uh -huh. Now this is, this pilot, he would be doing all kinds of devilish work from trying to just mess with the mind of the pilot up front. So this guy, the teacher, the instructor, would be uh, putting in some all kinds of scenarios that might pop up in an actual flight. Maybe an engine goes out, or maybe uh, somebody shoots a missile at you, or uh, there's any number of different things. So, uh, so anything that would try to uh, cause this guy up front to have to react. So how old is this? This uh, is about 50 years old. Wow, I okay. I, I can tell you, I got my iPad here. I, the reason I brought it is because we have a brand new website that's coming out. Hmm. And so I want to advertise that. Probably of within course. the next week, we're going to have a new website. Any, any information that I say, you can say, I don't trust that guy. I don't, think, <laughs> I don't think he knows what he's talking about. And you can go directly to our website and you can see for yourself. And so let's say I go to explore aircraft. Sorry, this is what yeah. you call dead time. While he's looking that up, you actually, I'm going to show you, and I'm going to walk out and show you. So this is a, a small scale, what, what it, a small scale model of, I have to stay underneath it. Look, it's black. Uh, small scale model of what that flight simulator is for. So as you can see there, that is what, that is what that flight simulator actually is for. It's a beautiful, beautiful aircraft. This was built between 1963 and 1965. Wow. So I said uh, 50, it's probably 50, 55, 56 years old. Very cool. It's almost as old as me. <laughs> and that's one thing that you find that the 
it's kind of surprising with a lot of these airplanes that look fairly well kept and they look fairly new. Mm -hmm. They're actually pretty old. Very <laughs> neat. Mm -hmm. You're so I'm going to show something show off right here since it was mentioned. So tell us about this. This is the Richard W. Cree Main Exhibit Gallery. This is where the most of our exhibits are located, and it's named after one of the uh, uh, very important people at the museum, Mr. Cree. And uh, so we we named this after him. Now, one thing that you did mention, and you were kind of uh, saying that we might see something similar to this. Mm -hmm. Well, it, we are. This is the, the Wright Brothers original aircraft now this is not the this is not the not aircraft. the aircraft no, that, you have to go to washington dc so i'm going to back this, up so everybody can see this this is a replica so this is a replica of the original wright brothers plane so this is the first this is the first one that flew correct yes, yes. all right 1903 1903 how are we doing on sound Doing fine on sound. Just try and make sure we're not bumping around too much. We're getting a lot of jumpiness. I'm sorry. I'm trying. I know you're doing great, so We're rooting for you. All, All right. right. Uh, yeah, this was the, the Spirit of Kitty Hawk was named after this particular aircraft. This is the Kitty Hawk uh, 1903 Wright Flyer. And uh, if you look, this was the very first aircraft that is uh, noted to heavier than air to actually have flown. And it flew at Kitty Hawk, North Carolina. And I've actually been there. I've seen where they flew. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. And I recommend it. It's a wonderful trip. If you get a chance, go to Kitty Hawk and see the uh, uh, Wright Brothers Monument there. The Outer Banks are amazing. Oh, the Outer Banks are fantastic. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Uh -huh. So this is the main gallery, the Creek Gallery. And if you want to, if you could kind of do a little spin. All right, I'm going to try and spin, but not make anybody sick, okay? I'm going to do a nice slow so you can take in the whole of the room. I think that guy's super cool right there. He's super cool. That aircraft actually flew here during World War One. That airplane, it's a Curtis Jenny, and it was assigned to Love Field during World War I. And so it is the oldest aircraft in our uh, collection. And it is uh, uh, original to this field. Yeah, so this is the original oldest aircraft that they have. And yes, Barbara, it's a pancake plane. Oh, is somebody hungry? Yeah. <laughs> yes, if anybody's hungry. Sorry, guys. I apologize. I keep forgetting I'm holding a camera. All right. So I'm going to finish my span here real nice and slow. This one's pretty too. You see everything from the top and down. All right. All right, Dan, where are we headed to next? We're going to go look at the hidden. Uh, we're going to. Lighter than air. Lighter than air. We have one of the most fantastic lighter than air collections of artifacts in the United States and maybe even in the world. Yeah. Uh, and here we go. I want to show you something that I think is just simply amazing. This chair. All right, this chair. It is amazing. And what makes it amazing is it came off of the hinging door. Now, most of you remember the Hindenburg as being going up in flames and uh, all the humanity and all that. Uh, uh, it was a terrible, terrible, terrible accident. Well, here's what happened. This chair, this chair. does not really look like it's been through a real rough time other than the fact that it's kind of old. But that's because this chair was in the radio room of the Hindenburg. Now, the radio room contained a lot of radio equipment, and radio equipment back in those days was big and bulky, and it had a lot of uh, tubes and all sorts of stuff. And so it was, it was considered to be a fire hazard. 
And because it was a fire hazard aboard a dirigible that was filled with very flammable heat, uh, hydrogen, they decided that they would insulate the radio compartment. And what they were going to do was if there was a fire aboard the, the uh, airship and it was in the radio department, they were going to sacrifice all the radio department to save the airship. So they were going to contain the fire within the radio room. What actually happened was just the opposite. The fire started outside of the radio room at the back of the airship and it moved forward. So see if I can get you this picture here. So here you go. It started in the back and it moved forward. Mm -hmm. But because the radio room was insulated, it was protected from the fire and the chair and the radio operator survived. So the chair and the radio operator survived. When I came over for my first uh, test tour to make sure we would have signals, I was I was like, well, it looks fine. What, there's, how is that possible? So it's very, very neat. So are these um, like, is this melded metals that, from the fire? That is actually part, that's melted metal from the fire. It's part of the aluminum that made up the frame of the Hindenburg. Oh, wow. And those are little ingots that uh, were picked up hmm. uh, from the Hindenburg. Now, here's the one thing that I think is fascinating. The captain of the Hindenburg, this was his cigarette case. So this was the cigarette case. And it was in on his person, in his pocket. Of the captain. Of uh, the captain at the time of the accident. Now the captains also survived the wreck. Uh, and uh, so he went back, he went outside. And so he survived the wreck, but he went back inside to try to save other people. And in the process became horribly burned. Oh. And he died the next day. So, hmm. but uh, he was wearing, or he had this on his person at that time. And so, so I find this picture at the bottom here interesting. I'm going to try and not get a glare on it. So, those are basically the charred remains of what was left. Mm -hmm. Apologize for the glare, guys. We're behind some glass, but, but you can come see all these things in person. I'm just looking at some, just some move other your camera a little bit slower, though. Okay, got it, Dan. Thanks. Yeah, all right. Uh, now, how many people were on the Hindenburg when it when it uh when the accident happened? Do we know? I think it was about 50 or so. Okay, yeah, yeah I mean, uh, the actual passenger area was very posh, and people who flew in, in airships that in that time. It was a great uh, privilege and also very expensive. And it was only the very most wealthy who could do that. The richest of the rich. Uh, yeah. Uh -huh. Very uh, neat. Mm -hmm. Okay. So let's go over here. And now we're going to go over to the World War II section. Okay. World War II, here mm -hmm. we come. So we're walking over this. We're way. walking. We're walking. We're walking. Getting our exercise today. While we're walking, guys, how much are tickets and do you need a reservation to visit the museum during this time? You do not need a reservation. Tickets are very according to uh, usually $10 for adults. Uh, if you're over 65, I believe I have to look it up. It's $8, I believe. That sounds about right. Uh, if you are uh, Children seven through seven or four through seventeen, it's seven dollars. Uh, three and under are free, and we're open Monday through Saturday from ten to five, and on Sunday from one to five. Okay, this is a beautiful model of a B seventeen flying fortress. Um, B seventeen, the flying fortress, uh, was our one of our uh, mainstay bombers during World War II, and uh, it's very famous. And I actually got a chance to fly in one at one time. It was very awesome. Too. Yeah, so. so I'm going to yeah. show you that. So this is just a so 
What's the scale on this? Do we need one nine scale? Yeah, just one nine scale. And I wanted to show you the model because a lot of the museum has a lot of models here. Mm -hmm. and we have a model shop and they do fantastic work. They built this, they built uh, a lot of these models. Oh, wow. Uh, and so it's just, uh, they do a fantastic job on it. Obviously, airplanes are big right. by very nature. And you can't just put, if you wanted to get a hundred airplanes, you, we couldn't get it in here. Right. So we got to shrink a few of them so that we can have a few big and a few smaller ones. So I have to show this one off just because it, it, it just reminds me so much of something, you know, you've seen in an, in an old war movie, but the Valkyrie up here has got the girl on it. There was the reason why these guys fought. They fought for their ladies. They, That's well, right. They fought for their country and they fought for their ladies. Yeah. So, yeah. Very cool. Mm -hmm. Now, somebody mentioned pancakes. Pancakes. And so we're going to go over to the pancake now. This. I'm going to show you real quick. So this, so you can see from the side, I mean, it, look at how incredibly, look at how incredibly thin that is. And it has two tail fins. Right. Now, this was a uh, test prototype aircraft. It was uh, during World War II, and basically, uh, the Navy wanted an airplane that would take off in a very short space and land in a very short space. And that's really important because when you're on an aircraft carrier, you don't have a lot of runway either way for taking off or landing. So they wanted something that would be very short. And this was an idea. And at that time, whenever you're in war, uh, you it was all hands on deck and they would accept any number of different ideas and they'd give it a shot because you never knew what would uh, actually work. And this was an idea and it, this basically what this is, it's the flying wing. The whole fuselage is a wing. It creates lift, and because it creates lift, it and because it's at such a high angle of attack, it creates lift quickly, and it is able to take off and land in very short space. This particular airplane was we only made one of them, and uh, it was uh, fairly successful. Uh, they were going to work on creating a production aircraft called the XF-5U. This was made by Bot, Chance Bot. And uh, they started working on it, but the war ended and they just said, scrap it. Hmm. And so nothing ever came of it. Uh, it was an airplane that was in a way ahead of its time because now we do have flying wings. Uh, if, there are certain airplanes that uh, you'll see uh, the Osprey in particular mm -hmm. uh, has these huge oversized propellers on the tips of the wings. Uh, and uh, they do provide the ability to take off and land. So I was looking at the information board and I found this fascinating because he said it's just a giant wing, which would make it hollow, correct? It's only 2,700 pounds is what this weighs. That is compared to- Remember the-, the Yeah, uh, when we were outside. Yeah. yeah this, uh, you know, this is a legend of the aircraft and I don't know that it's totally been proven, but uh, supposedly Charles Lindbergh flew this airplane. Oh, did you guys hear that? Supposedly, Charles Lindbergh actually flew, flew this airplane. Times, and he said it flew well. And it flew well. He yeah, liked it. All he right. Now, yeah. well, we're going to go next. To, we've got some nice big, what we call big iron here. This is our world, our uh, Vietnam. So these are Vietnam era aircraft right yeah, here. And these are also made by Vought. Uh, okay. So they're made by the same company that made, that made the pancake. Yes, they're made by Vought. Vought was located over in Grand Prairie. Oh, yeah. so they're local. They're local. That's why we have them here. We tend to uh, focus on local aircraft. 
Now, at the time when they built bought, built that aircraft, they were on the East Coast. Mm. But after the war, a uh, factory that was over in Grand Prairie that was utilized by North American Aviation became empty. And so they decided, hey, that's a brand new factory built during the war. Let's just move everything over there. And so they built, they moved the entire uh, manufacturing uh, firm to Grand Prairie. And they built these type of airplanes. This is a uh, Crusader. Oh, this is a Crusader. This is a airplane, but it also had, uh, there was a fighter uh, version of it. This over here is called the Corsair 2. This is a Corsair 2. My goodness, look at all the. Airplane. Wow. That's why we ha that's why it's heavily loaded with bombs and missiles and stuff. Yeah, look here, I gotta show you guys over here. If you look, well first of all, I just love love the the detail work on it. But over here, man, okay, so you've got this is a sidewinder and it's probably as big as I am. It's an early model sidewinder. So that's an that's early model. Story. Yeah, they actually got so then you've got, so th this was this was for doing damage, my goodness. Wow, that, that carries a lot. Definitely, yeah, it can carry a lot of ordnance. Yep. Now, now we're, actually I am now standing in just on the edge of our space gallery. I told you we were the, a premier air and space museum in Texas. And that's because we also have a brand new gallery that's dedicated to space. And right over here. So this is super cool, you guys. We're going to go look at this one. Cool. This is, there's only one in the world. And it's right here. It's the Apollo 7 capsule. This is the command module. And come on. So we're going to, you get to look inside. We can't touch, but we can look. So. So the me these are the mechanisms just on the door. And then Dan's got a really interesting story to tell us after we, we look around and we look inside. So one thing I'm going to point out, so let's look inside. So this is where they're sitting and they've got a ton of controls up top. How oh, neat. Okay, so I'm gonna point out something and then Dan's gonna explain why I'm pointing it out. So. So as you notice, this door opens out, okay? And there is significance to this, which I am going to let him talk about because he knows more than I do. Oh. <laughs> this door is, part of, is a modification from the original Apollo command module. The original Apollo command module that was uh, to be flown in Apollo 1, uh, and remember, this is Apollo 7. The Apollo 1 command module had a different door, and there was a fire that occurred in testing on uh, at Cape Canaveral or Cape Kennedy that involved the crew being trapped inside the, the uh, module, and because the door didn't open outward like this, and they determined that that was a contributing factor to the death of the astronauts. And so they spent a number of years redoing the module, command modules, to make it safer. And one of the safety uh, uh, things that came out of it was a door that could be opened outward. And Very this cool. is the same type of door that was on all the uh, subsequent Apollo command modules. So Apollo 11 that went to the moon, this is the same door basically the same door that they used for that the whole module or the whole command module is in fact the same now i think it's interesting they will tell you uh, there are various astronauts uh, uh, walt cunningham is a friend of the museum and he flew in this uh spacecraft and he will tell you that uh you know, there's not a lot of uh, real estate in there but it really wasn't too bad uh in terms of uh you, you after all, you got a great view. Location, location, location. You you got a great view of the Earth, and you were so you were right next to the person next to you. The other thing I noticed was you'll see that all of these uh, different uh, switches and stuff have guards. So 
and that's because Sing the guards. whenever they were wearing heavy uh, gloves and stuff, they wanted to make sure that you didn't actually fat finger or something, and that you really didn't want it to be uh, turned on or off. So they had all these guards. So you basically, when you press the button, you were really intending to press, press that, that button. button. Okay, so here's my question. Sure. All right, so I'm as I'm looking at this, right, I'm noticing remnants of silver on the on mm -hmm. on the capsule. So let me show you what I'm talking about. So up here you see the silver. Yeah. You see silver. There's some like over here. So to, is that what it was actually painted? And from re-entering of the burn, it burned off the silver. Yes, the original capsule was silver. And it had a silver uh, film over the outside of it. Mm -hmm. Now, part of it came off during the re-entry. It burned off. Mm -hmm. If you look at the underside of the capsule, you'll see it was terribly charred. And that's part of the uh, uh, plan for re-entry is that took the brunt of the heat. Okay. That's the heat shield. Let me see if I, I'm going to see if I can, I can so show you. Your story, okay. You might know. There's areas you can see up towards the top where there's still a little bit of silver up there. there. Mm -hmm. Now, whenever it came back to back to the earth and it landed and they picked it up and, and put it aboard an aircraft carrier, a lot of the sailors took souvenirs. Ah. So this is just like a, a thin film of silver over the outside of the capsule. Mm -hmm. And so they would come and take a strip and they'd have their own souvenir from the day that, hey, when we recovered the Apollo 7 command module. How oh, neat. So I'm going to show you what he was talking about here. You can actually see how charred the underside is from re-entry, which is really neat it's 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 interesting to see in person too because it's got a um a honeycomb texture to it this particular what it is it's made out of a honeycomb it's got a form mm -hmm. a honeycomb form mm -hmm. they put a type of uh polymer around it mm -hmm. and that would absorb the heat and basically it would burn off and so in the process of burning off it would separate from the capsule and it would take that superheated uh, air with it oh how neat and so that's how it kept the capsule the inside of the capsule cool so one of our one of our um okay so we we got a lot so patricia mills husband worked on apollo eight and nine Awesome. And then we had another person say that they actually have a strip of the silver and some honeycomb from one of them. That belongs to the U.S. government. Uh oh, <laughs> that I didn't see that. <laughs> we didn't see that. <laughs> How great! All right. Now let's just do a 360, and let's come over here. The only place that you're going to find a piece of the moon in North Texas is. Right here. Oh, let's look. Museum. I mean, it doesn't look like a giant. There you go. It's just it's, a small little. It's just a little pebble. It, it and it's here we go. Oh, this is a good view of it too, so you can really see it. It's it's black. It's beautiful. It's called Breca. Is the name of the mineral. So Breca is Breca the name of the mineral. It's a very uh, common rock up on the moon. And it's formed whenever uh, these uh, meteorites would hit the moon and it would superheat the minerals and the, the soil or the, uh, and it would fuse it. How neat. And so and it would form this kind of rock called Breca. So this, this came back from the Apollo 15 mission and it was uh, part of a larger rock and they came, brought it back. They cut it open so that they could see what was on the inside. Mm -hmm. And this was a, just a, a fragment that just kind of broke off from it. The actual size of the rock was about the size of a football. Wow. And it weighed about 15 pounds. Mm -hmm. we, this is what we get. But, you know, it's not much. Hey, we're glad to have it because, like I said, you can't go anywhere else in North Texas and see the moon.
Oh, this neat. Close. There you go. You got that close to the moon. I can tell people, look, I almost touched the you moon. You can almost touch the moon. Almost touch the moon. So what, tell me about this behind us. So is this sure. a live, is this a live feed of? No, it's not live. Okay. No, what we, we do have uh, different programs so that it can show whether it's a day or a week. Okay. Uh, but this is not a live we don't have it so, so long. So this is just really cool. And unfortunately, because of COVID, we're not able to allow people to use this, but you can do all kinds of fun stuff with this. If I want to change it to, let's say, Jupiter. Oh, wow. So you can actually change. Oh, that's beautiful. So you've been to the moon or you've got moon. Close Got real close moon. to the moon. Yeah, now I'm look how close you are. To I'm Jupiter. really close to Jupiter too. Oh, the colors in that are just beautiful. How fun! So we can do all kinds of stuff. So if you really do want to, touch the moon, so now the there's our moon. Oh, that's really neat. And Saturn, but with if you want to see what Saturn would look like without its ring, that's what it looks like. Not nearly as fascinating. As it is Saturn. not. It, Saturn's pretty plain. It's, it's pretty plain. Thank goodness for those rings. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then Mars. There we go. Yeah. That's really neat. Very cool. All right. Awesome. Tell me about Perot's plane. Oh, you. Okay. <laughs> All right. Straight up, I'm going to see the plane that says U.S. Air Force. And that plane was actually uh, bought. So this was bought by Ross Perot. By Ross Perot. Uh -huh. And he wanted to fly it. And uh, the U.S. Uh, government said, excuse me, but that airplane is still an active duty aircraft in the, our military. And no civilian can own an active duty aircraft type even though he bought this from a uh, third world country mm -hmm. that was trying to sell that's one of the central american countries uh and so whenever he they had a long discussion about it but eventually uh of course the government wins and so he gave it to us so yeah. so this is a true look at how neat i'm just amazed you know, gosh, how much would that cost? Uh, millions of millions wow. of dollars. <laughs> wow. Yeah. yeah. Wow. So, so I mean, if, if you bought it, I don't know what, who, who he bought it from, Honduras or somebody like that. Right. I'm sure they probably gave it to him at a good price. Mm -hmm. Now, there's a couple more space related artifacts I want to show you. So, we're looking at this guy next, right yeah. here. Okay. Right here. Sorry. Oh, yes, yeah. No, you're doing fine. Yeah. This is Spaceship One. Spaceship One was the winner of the X Prize, the Ansari X Prize. This was the first privately produced spacecraft to take a pilot and take a man into space, or one, excuse me, but in this case, it was a man, uh, take a man into space and then bring him back home safely. And this is a replica, the original. Once again, the Smithsonian gets all the originals. But this is. Sorry, guys. I don't know how that happened. I ended up muted there for a second. Ooh, wait, do I need to go over it again? Uh, I think, how much did we get of that, Dan? None. Hello? None. Is that you fair? Your and your audio is going in and out. It's it, it's there. You talk again, Zo. Oh. Oh. Zo, unmute. Okay. Any better? Much better. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So, okay. what was the last thing you heard? I don't hear that. Dan. Yes. No. I'm sorry. Say that again. What was the last thing you heard? Oh, you don't, don't, don't put me on the spot like that, so. Yeah, <laughs> oh, sorry. It's just, I, know, I got muted and I don't know how it happened, so. It was the, never, you we never heard anything about the plane overhead. Thank you, Toby. Yeah, yeah, so we were talking about 
about this guy. So it's the first ever private aircraft to go into space and successfully bring someone home. Yeah. All right. Yeah. And well, you'll notice it has M&M's logo on the side. M&M's was a sponsor. Oh. And one of the reasons why they have that is because the pilot, how he proved he was in space, was he had a package of M&Ms mm. and he released them into the uh, cockpit and they were floating around. So he knew that it was weightlessness. So he was in space. So, uh, and so that's how it was a very good marketing thing for m and Very smart, yeah. very smart. All right, so we've got about 10 minutes. Do we wanna- we we'll got a question real quick. Yeah, uh, there was one question. Is it true that moon rocks glow when there's a full moon outside? No, it's not true. Okay. Moon rocks true. do not glow. <laughs> okay. It would be cool if they did, they though. They just reflect the light of the sun the same as the Earth does and uh, other planets. So uh, the, they don't have any luminescence of their own. Okay. They just reflect. Hey, wait, I want to look at this really quick. Hang on. They have an adopt a plane program here. So if you've got, that would be super cool. If you know somebody who's really into aircraft and planes, that's a little pricey. I mean, I'll be, I'll be honest, but it is super cool. I want to adopt the pancake. Is the pancake adopted? Pancake? Yeah. No, no, it hasn't been adopted. The pancake, I just need, all right, guys, let's raise $10,000. Celebration can adopt I, the pancake. What do you think? <laughs> And also, uh, Zoe, in the, in the 10 minutes, is there any chance that we can see those uniforms for the brand? I, I got oh. that. Awesome. Awesome. <laughs> so here I do while we're walking by. So this is an Apollo 7. Yeah, space uniform. So this is what would have been worn in the capsule. Yeah. Owen Isley was one of the uh, astronauts that flew in Apollo 7. Owen Isley, Walt Cunningham, and Wally Sharaw were the uh, astronauts in Apollo 7. And so you can see what they would be wearing. Very cool. We're going upstairs and we're going to take a peek at our Branus display. Yeah, we're on top of this. Mm -hmm. All right, hang on. I'm going to flip my camera around for a second. So you can see us. Look, there we are. We're, and we're walking upstairs. upstairs. You like my mask? It's got suns and moons on it. I thought it was appropriate for today. And we have Sputnik, the model of Sputnik. Oh, that's cool. Hang on, let me flip, guys, so you can see. So there's a model of Sputnik right there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and if you go to our new website, you can actually hear Sputnik. Oh, very cool. Did you hear well, that? If you go to the website, you can hear him. Yes. Well, that would be cool. Mm -hmm. We've lost Dan's audio completely right now, Zoe, just so you know. We're, we're not talking. Oh, good. Then we're doing great. Keep oh, up. We were just finishing going up the stairs. Mm -hmm. All right. So this. This is the Brennan display. And we have the fantastic uniforms from Brennan. Brennan was an amazing airline. Way ahead of its time, actually. I mean, it, kind of melded aviation, art, and fashion all in one and in a way that I hadn't seen any other airline do. And so you had a very well, advanced airline for its time and it was located here in the FW. Hmm. And so you had the- And they're all, they're all being safe. Like they've all got their masks on. So yeah, let's look at these. Masks. So it's pretty amazing. I mean, I would wear that. Look, I remember in the 80s, the skirts that had the, the waistbands like that. I'm giving away my age. So we've got... 37, 47. Wow, 37, 47. 57. All right, so there we go. Look, right here. Okay, here we go. 1957, so this uniform right here, okay? We're gonna look at the name plaque down there, courtesy of Julia Smithwick Kidd. Yeah. 
Yes. Very neat. So this would have been 1962. This is what one of the yeah. the yeah. planes the looks plane, like. Plane. The color, they were not planes, but they had all kinds of different colors. Now, Southwest just got me through that. Yeah, yeah. The yeah. Colors and, and the different artwork from the different states. But really, Braniff was one of the first ones to do it. And it had yellow airplanes, it had orange airplanes. Uh, How cool. Blue red all kinds of different colors uh, so it was uh, well ahead of its time and like i said i love the fact that it had fashion and art all tended to come together some of the planes were actually painted in colors of uh, calder artist uh calder and he just uh so it was really a fantastic air airline and it was still very popular in terms of there's a, a group that still follows uh, uh, a historical group, and it's a very large and very active group that keeps up the traditions of Braniff. How neat. How neat. I love this. Love that pink. It matches my hair with the pink stockings. I want that bag right there for my own personal bag. I could use it for anything. Look, fashion, it could be used for anything. Man, how psychedelic is this? Is this not so cool? Look at that. Wow. He does stuff for Tiffany. Yeah. yeah. Uh, what did you have there? This was back before the current masks, but they, at the time, I guess they were emulating the space, the space helmets. I don't know if you can see that, but there's a clear helmet on this uh, uh, lady's head. And uh, I would hate to have to wear that. A mask is bad enough, but to have to wear that, pretty bad. So they actually had to wear, if you look, you see. So the clear bubble around, they have masks on just for fun, guys. Yes, yes. I did see that come through. I don't think that the mannequins can get COVID. Yes, really <laughs> yes. This is beautiful. I mean, look at this. It's absolutely beautiful. The two-tone colors, the green. So it was reversible, maybe, maybe. I can't tell, but it's gorgeous. Very neat, very neat. So, and there's Spaceship One from a different point of view. Oh, yes. Here, you can get a really good view of Spaceship One from a mirror. Oh, uh, yes. Now, yes, yes, yes. So now, now you can see. So if you see right there, that little guy. So that's the M&M's logo on the plane. Well, this is not a plane. This is a, an a air, spacecraft. a spacecraft. spacecraft. And like I said, this is not the original. The original is in the Boeing Hall of, uh, uh, in uh, the Smithsonian, together with other aircraft like the original Wright Brothers, the original Spirit of St. Louis, and all these other guys. But they made seven copies of it uh, that were replicas, life-size replicas, and they gave it to different museums throughout the United States to... Uh, commemorate the actual event. Very cool. And I apologize to everyone watching this right now. If my camera was shaking, it was Dan's fault because he made me laugh. <laughs> my Dan's fault. He sent me a, a mess. He uh, sent a message. He was making fun of me because I did not call it a spacecraft. So, uh, yes. Well, it, it is a spacecraft. It's, it's a reasonable. It lands like, it lands like a spacecraft or aircraft. It's kind of like the uh, space shuttle. So, so it, is it the outline? Is that where the the land? Like, what is the outline that's there? There's actually, it's just the shell because it's a replica. Oh. It doesn't actually have landing gear. Right. Is that where? It uh, would but be? that's where the landing gear would be. Very cool. Now, I don't know if you viewers will want to look at this and see. Look how the wings tilt upwards. Oh wow! The wings go. Oh oh. Okay, so so okay, so we're looking at it like this. So this back section here, right? It tilts up. What is the purpose of that? It's called the butterfly. Okay. And remember we how we were talking about uh, 
reentry and mm -hmm. how the Apollo used the uh, to burn off heat to, mm -hmm. okay through a heat shield. This is a way that they could slow the aircraft down mm -hmm. without incurring a lot of heat. Ah. It, it sort of takes on the same type of uh, science as if you have a badminton uh, shuttlecock. Mm -hmm. You know how it's got the feathers and stuff on the end? Mm -hmm. Those feathers, uh, they slow down the aircraft to the point, or the spacecraft in this case, so that it can come back and land as an airplane. Very cool. So, yeah. Zara, the the audio is doing that thing again, where it's you're you're shrinking your audio down. The audio is shrinking to nothing. Y'all are like really minute in your audio. Better. Nope. Try muting me. All right, hold on. And then I'll unmute myself. Okay. 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 All right, unmute yourself. Any better? Not even a little. Oh, all right. It, it's, 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 no, it's just, I think the Zoom is just messing me up. I will be right back, Dan, okay? Okay, sounds good. Hi, everyone. How we doing? Thank you all so much so far for being really patient with us today as we've had a few technical difficulties. But as you can tell, it has been all it has not all been for naught because here Thank comes you. Zoe. So let's do this real quick. Welcome. Let's see where where is Zoe? Zoe talk for me. Zoe? Did you tell any good jokes while I was gone? No, I didn't have enough time, you know, but uh, I'm, let's see. There All you right. go. Good. All right. We're going to go up towards the front. Um, and Dan is willing to ask any questions that, it, or yeah, he's going to answer. I don't know. He can ask them, but we might not know the answers. He's going to answer any questions that we have. All right. So if there's any questions for anybody, we'll stand right up here. We have a lot of great comments, great tour. So interesting. Great We're tour. This is really great. Really great. Very informative and interesting. Wonderful tour. Many thanks. Got to run. It was awesome. Absolutely love this tour. Sorry, finger slipped. That's not what I don't think that was part of what they were trying to get to. Uh, even with sound problems, very interesting. This is, they had a great time, guys. I mean, this is wonderful. Okay. Yeah. Dan, Good. thank you so much. Oh, well, I'm glad everybody enjoyed it. So that being said, if there's no questions coming through, um, Dan, thank you so much My for doing pleasure. this with us today. Um, there is a lot. Yes, Christine, there is a lot to see here. It really is a neat place. Some amazing stories and history and no Kathy I will fight you for it I want the psychedelic outfit um so thank you so much for joining